I'm Edie Lush, executive editor of Hub Culture. It is Davos 2023. Really pleased to be one with one of our partners here. Thank you so much for coming along, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. So you are the CEO of Ahura AI. Brian, I'd love to take a bigger picture before we zoom in on what you mm -hmm. do. I know that on a lot of the measures of how the world has advanced, we rolled back during COVID, and education is probably the most heartbreaking one of those measures. We haven't even caught up from, from where we kind of lost in terms of, of educational gain. I'd love to hear your perspective on that uh, and how that fits in with the general theme here at Davos, fragmentation, uh, connecting, collaborating in a fragmented world. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Look, we suffered a lot globally as a result of the pandemic and all the lockdowns. And one of the things that became extremely clear is this idea of asymmetric learning, um, much like Coursera, Khan Academy, and everything else that we build, was supposed to be this panacea of learning to democratize mm. access to education to everyone. But it turns out that the challenge is we took this one-size-fits-all approach to learning mm. that we do in a school system, right, with a teacher with 30 students, or in college, a teacher with 200 students, and we expanded that out online. And it turns out that it's very challenging for most people mm. to sit in front of a computer and focus for an hour or five hours or six hours, mm. especially for children. Yeah. It's hard enough for adults. Yeah. So a little known fact is a lot of these organizations that teach adult learners online have a four to eight percent completion rate. Oh my goodness. So even when people are paying wow. tens of thousands of dollars for education, wow. they have a 92 to 94% churn rate, wow. which means that that money is going away, much less kindergartners or elementary schoolers to so yeah. ask them to stay focused for so long, especially since this is not happening in a vacuum. We mm. live in a world where we have the attention economy. We have this world where these corporations, tech companies, mm. have spent billions of dollars, hired armies of psychiatrists and NLP professionals to find ways to capture your attention mm. so that you scroll forever yeah. so that they can sell you advertising. Yeah. And so every time someone sits in front of a computer and their Facebook goes bing, 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 bing yeah. <laughs> or their YouTube or what have you, yeah. they get distracted. We all know the we cost well. of context switching yeah. and so forth. And so that's a really big challenge. And of course, now there's an entire generation of students who are behind, who are yeah. trying to catch up, and we have to find a better way. And it's extraordinary because that isn't just limited to one culture. I remember during the pandemic, I interviewed some students in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. really struggling with physics, whether there was, you know, whether they could get connection, whether they could actually see their teacher, how do they do it online? And I went to tell my son about this, and he said, well, yeah, I can't stand doing physics online. It's the worst thing. And I just thought, God, no one's figured this out sure. in any part of the world. Um, so, okay, that's where we are. That's the challenge. Tell me a little about what you're learning um, through Ahura and what you see as the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before I tell you what we're doing at Ahura and why, mm. there are some people that did figure it out. So I will push back on okay. that. Okay. So there were little clumps of groups in Silicon Valley and Manhattan and the Hamptons and other mm -hmm. super wealthy enclaves that realized during COVID that their kids aren't going to learn very effectively in a, sitting in front of a computer. So what they did is hired these teachers but they took two or three, four families, mm -hmm. put their kids together, yep. hired these very expensive teachers to yep. sit in front of the students one-on-one -on -one or one to two, one to three, and give that personalized attention. Yeah. It turns out that's the way we learn best. In fact, mm. there, were, there was a study in 1982 called the Bloom Study, and about 30 studies after that that uh, replicated it, that showed that when people learn one-on-one, -on -one, they learn significantly faster mm. and they retain that information longer. Now. Of course, in our world, it's almost impossible to have half the population teach the other half, right? That right. just isn't scalable. And so what we did at Ahura is we thought, what if we apply emerging technology around cognitive science and artificial intelligence to replicate that one-on-one -on -one instruction? So if you're sitting there in front of your mom or in front of your teacher mm. and you get distracted, you pull out your phone on Facebook, your teacher will say, hey, put that away, let's right. focus. Right. If your eyes glaze over, the teacher can see that when they're sitting one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, if there are 30 students, they don't have the time to give that personalized, personalized attention yeah. to everyone. And so to her, what we decided to do is create that hyper-personalized education, give that power of focus 
back to the individual so that they can learn three to five times faster than traditional education. Hmm. Now, if we applied this to corporate learning, it turns out as a, as a worker, you need to constantly upskill. You need to constantly learn new skill sets. And for corporations, there's a value in upskilling your employees so they're more productive. Mm. And so there's a, there's a win-win there. Down the road, we're definitely looking forward to applying this more broadly to entire populations. Interesting. Why is education so important to you, Brian? Well, uh, you know a little bit about my history, and that's, I think, why you asked mm. that question. Uh, for uh, other people that might not, I was born in a tiny village with no running water and no electricity. Uh, we escaped to the country of Iran, went to Turkey, lived in a refugee camp for a couple of years, and I was inc inc incredibly fortunate. We um, got our political asylum, and we came to the United States, mm. where I suddenly had access to the American education system and access to opportunity. As people much smarter than me have said in the past, a, a, a genius and capability are evenly distributed across the world, mm. but access to education and opportunity are not. Mm. And so for me, uh, it's really important to provide that access to people around the world. So when I founded Uhura, we decided, and we've kept up with this, that for every license that we sell to corporates and to governments, we give away a free license of our technology to members of underserved communities mm. globally especially with a gender and diversity lens. So for people living in refugee camps, for people living in villages in sub-Saharan Africa and slums mm. in India and so forth, to have access to the tool set that will enable them to get dignified work and be able to take care of their families and impact their communities. Interesting. So I know that it's not just education that you, you care about. You care about trust in, uh, in the internet. You think about a lot of different things. Tell me about some of your, your more philanthropic activity. Sure, absolutely. Well, so being an artificial intelligence expert and mm -hmm. being in this space, I recognize that we can use AI to massively improve the human condition. But unfortunately, like with any technology, it can be used to hurt society or potentially even cause existential risk and mm. the extinction of the human race. And Which so, is not a good way to No, end. it's a terrible <laughs> thing. Let's pause on that. Don't want to do that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I don't want to live in a bunker and it would be no. terrible if this uh, human experience was to yeah. end. And so one of the things I decided to do is I launched a nonprofit uh, called Digital Guardians. Um, Richard Branson very generously let us do that on his island, on Necker mm -hmm. Island. He uh, participated as well and helped with the launch of this nonprofit. And what we did is very much the intellectual successor to the elders. Mm -hmm. And we brought together the elders of the artificial intelligence community. Mm -hmm. So AI experts from Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, OpenAI, SpaceX, and, and so forth, to come together to basically say, look, guys, we all compete internationally, and that's great. We should continue doing that. But can we all agree that if we accidentally destroy the world with AI, that's a bad thing? And of course, everyone <laughs> says, yes, that's yep, a terrible agree thing. That. And so I ask them, can we all collaborate on this one area to work together to make sure we uh, build a paradigm around ethical artificial intelligence and pool our resources and, and capabilities and our reputations to apply pressure on bad actors so that we can continue to move the human race forward, we can continue to evolve, we can continue to build amazing technologies that will improve our condition while mitigating some of the risks of um, bad actors. Interesting. And it's not just AI you care about. You also care about space, which I absolutely love. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was growing up. So tell me about that as well. Sure. Well, so I, when I came to the country, I was six years old. I was very fortunate. After teaching myself quantum mechanics and differential equations in middle school, I began working at NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center when I was 16. I worked on the Constellation X project. And it was quite fun. I really enjoyed it. I also wanted to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm until I found out oh, I can't. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, that's okay. I wasn't a natural born citizen. <laughs> okay. I was naturalized. Okay. And so um, what I decided to do is get into the tech space. Now, going full circle, one of the things I realized, because I still kept up with a lot of my friends at NASA mm. and in the aerospace community and really the, the space uh, emerging new space. And one of the things I recognized is that there's this false narrative that has come to be over the past five years, which is that these space entrepreneurs are just billionaire playboys that want to build rockets to say, I have a bigger right. rocket than you do. And it's absolutely absurd and it's not true. These, all three of these guys, uh, Elon, Richard, and Jeff, 
care very deeply about the human race. Mm. They care very deeply about our future, about us becoming a multiplanetary species and moving forward. Uh, and yet they're getting attacked from all sides for work that they're doing, which is absolutely phenomenal mm. for the human race. And yet at the same time, there are some, uh, some competition that happens between them and so forth. And so what I decided to do is see if we can bring everybody together, all the leaders within the space community, along with NASA, along with the investors, a bunch of astronauts, to come together and say, hey, there's enough space for all of us. Right. <laughs> Pun intended. Yeah. How do we actually all collaborate within the Artemis countries mm -hmm. to make the entire space industry 100 times bigger rather than fighting over tiny pieces of the pie? Interesting. And so uh, this is a heavy lift, obviously. I want to get everybody's buy-in in order to do this effectively uh and it's a work in progress fantastic come back and tell me how it's going next year oh, Brian. i definitely will thank you so much for joining us thank you for your partnership here in davos and i'm edie lush